Hi, my name is Tyler Don Rosenquist, and welcome to Character in Context, where we explore scripture in its original historical context and talk about how God is communicating his expectations to us as his image bearers. Well, this is our very first episode, and I imagine you probably have no idea who I am, so I will do a short introduction. I am an archaeology nerd. I love studying the history of the biblical world and especially the sociology of ancient cultures, which I will talk about a lot because Bible people didn't think the way we do and certainly didn't live like we do. They had different values and an entirely different worldview. And that can make it really difficult to understand some of the stuff they did that looks really messed up to us but made perfect sense to them at the time and as well as to the original audience, the Bible. Anyway, I've been married to my husband, Mark, for almost 28 years, and we have two almost 18-year-old sons at the time I am recording this. I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry from UC Davis, but I have spent a number of years now just engrossed in the overwhelming amount of scholarly materials available about the Bible. I've always been a history buff, but once I discovered the scholarship out there about the ancient Near Eastern and first century world, Everything else just sort of took a back seat, and I have two websites, um, theancientbridge.com and contextforkids.com, and that's not with a number four, that's an F-O-R, because I'm really not that hip. And I've written six books, five on ancient Near Eastern first century context, and one apologetic. Now, before we get started, I, I have a disclaimer, you know... I study all day, I, I love this, I do this, but you know what? This is the kingdom of heaven and not the kingdom of scholars. So I don't want you to feel intimidated just because I love doing this. This is what I love, you know, this is what I study all day, I write about it. But you know, this isn't everyone's job in the kingdom. And this is a kingdom of doers, not a kingdom of scholars. It's much more important to be the people who are out there actually doing things for the lost, for the people who are vulnerable and in need. That's what we were put here on earth for, to be God's image bearers, to be a picture of his righteous and just world, caring for the least of these, just doing what is right. I don't think he had in mind a kingdom of people who sit on their butts in front of social media pontificating. <laughs> no, there's more than enough people doing that. And yeah. <laughs> and I'm one of them. But listen, you know, we're going to talk about different types of Bible translations and whatever. And you know, that really, unless you're getting into really heavy scholarship, I'll tell you something, the important stuff about the kingdom is the same regardless of what translation you use. No matter what version of the Bible you use, you're going to see humility, you're going to see meekness, you're going to see forgiveness, and peacemaking, and patience, and gentleness, and kindness, and self-control, loyalty, all of those things. Those don't change with the translation. And I think sometimes we lose sight of the big picture and the big picture is to get back to Eden. Back to the way Adam and Eve were when they were perfectly representing God as opposed to the way we are now <laughs> where, yeah, not so much. But I don't care if you have one dollar or a billion dollars if you are um, athletic or, you know, totally wimpy like me, or, you know, how attractive you are, how popular you are, how anything you are. To be the greatest in the kingdom, you don't need any of that. You just need to be conformed to the image of our Messiah, Yeshua, or you may call him Jesus. So anyway, with that disclaimer, let's, you know, let's get on with the context Ah, so today I want to talk about a word that has an entirely different meaning now than it did in Bible times. And I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know. Uh, in my life, a lot of words have changed meaning when I was, you know, when I was born, bad meant not good. 
And then when I was a teenager, bad meant awesome. And now it's pretty much back to meaning not good. Wicked meant incorrigible. Deviant horrible. <laughs> and then when I was in high school, it meant awesome, cool. And, uh, you know, 50 years ago, the word gay meant happy. And it was even a popular men's name. And not anymore. It isn't now. It means you're homosexual. So, you know, we see these words, and if that's happened just in the time that I've been alive, you know, which is 49 years, um, how much more so have words changed in the past 2,000 years? Or, you know, 3,000 years, depending on which part of the scriptures we're reading. So the word we're going to talk about this week is the word that gets translated into English as greed. And I know you're probably wondering, really, how can greed be anything but wanting to have a bunch of money? You know, we automatically think of Ebenezer Scrooge or Scrooge McDuck, depending how well read you are. <laughs> Uh, people sitting on a big pile of gold like Smaug the Dragon in The Hobbit. Um, so, in the Bible, we see this term, greedy for gain, over and over and over again. So we're going to read some verses. Um, Psalm 10.3 For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. Ooh, ouch. Um, Proverbs 119, such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain, takes away the life of its possessors. Jeremiah 613, so now we're getting prophets. For from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain, and from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. 1 Timothy 3.8, so now we're, we're, we're moving into the, uh, the epistles. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. Titus 1.7, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant, or hot-tempered, or a drunkard, or violent, or greedy for gain. So we see this phrase, greedy for gain, which still has not been defined, being paired with all sorts of awful things like false dealings, a double tongue that means lying, dig, uh, being undignified, being a drunkard, uh, being violent, hot-tempered, and prideful. So, you know, these are really serious crimes in the kingdom because they make for a bad witness and they disqualify people from leadership. Now, at first glance, this can sound kind of like a manifesto against capitalism if we're not careful to read it in context. But you know, we have to remember that the ancient world was what we would call a limited good society or a zero-sum game. This means that they only had so much of everything to go around. There was only so much food in a community. There was only so much land in a community. There was only so much honor or uh, good reputation in a community. Isn't that crazy? Now, when they say honor in the Bible, they don't mean like your internal sense of morality, like the thing that says, no, you don't con old people out of their money, or you run into the house the, the orphanage fire to get the children and not away from it. So that's what we consider an honorable man to be a man of integrity or an honorable woman to be a person of integrity. Um, but that's not what they saw honor. They saw honor as about a person's inherent reputation based on things like their status in society um, and their achievements in life. So they see honor as different than we do. And they thought that there's only so much honor to go around in a community. So if I get more honor, it means everybody else kind of goes down on the notches in the rating system. So yeah, it's very serious. And if you're more interested in learning that, because we're not going to talk about that a lot today, 
There's my book, Context for Kids, Honor and Shame in the Bible, available on Amazon. Also, there's a really good book by David De Silva called Honor, Patronage, Kinship, and Purity. That one's also really good. There's, there's actually a lot of books on the market about honor and shame in the Bible. It's a big, hot topic. Um, so, you were born into a certain station of life, like a caste system almost, and you had a certain amount of stuff. You had your ancestral lands, and that land produced a limited amount of food, and your family had more or less honor, remember reputation, based on a number of factors. And you were expected to be satisfied with your God-given place in society. It was your lot in life, and it was believed to be God-ordained. Um, so you, you were to hold on to your own land at all costs, but you were not to go taking advantage of the poor and thereby taking their land for yourself. You weren't supposed to get for yourself at the expense of your neighbor because it destroyed communities. That is what it means to be greedy for gain when you are getting at someone else's expense. You see, in a limited good society, they didn't have the luxury of thinking the way we think today. Now, we go and get a job, and if we do well, we get a promotion and a raise, and we can buy a bigger house and a new car, and we don't see that as greed because the salary came from doing an honest day's work, hopefully, and the accumulation of wealth wasn't at anyone else's expense. Compare this to the ancient world, where there was really almost no upward mobility to speak of. People knew their place, and there was honor in staying there because it contributed to an ordered society. Really, any ideas to the contrary are very new historically. If you've ever watched anything on the BBC, for example, their historical dramas attest to the idea of some people being better than others based entirely on birth. And, and you'll see those who, through engaging in trade, merchantry, um, I don't know if merchantry is a word, but I used it. Um, they obtained wealth and were considered to be like upstarts and illegitimate in society. You know, royals were allowed to be wealthy and expected to be wealthy. That was their God-ordained lot in life. But in the first century, and in the first century, you know, the, the emperor was also expected to be wealthy. But common people becoming wealthy generally meant one thing. It meant they must have exploited others in order to become wealthy. You couldn't get more land unless you took somebody else's. There was just no other way to do it. And there weren't many other ways of gaining money than through the land. Now, that was the perception, and, and actually it was also pretty much the reality. Now, you might protest, what about like Abraham and Jacob? Well, that's an excellent example of two men who became very wealthy. But it was because, well, one, it was because of working the land, which was always honorable way to gain money. But they were oppressed and God vindicated them by looting their enemies like Pharaoh, Abimelech, and Laban. Um, that's the kind of story everyone enjoys, right? Someone robs someone else or swindles them or oppresses them. And God engineers this really cool reversal of fortune that transfers the wealth and status of the bad guy to the good guy. We also see this with Joseph. You know, he went from slave to wrongfully imprisoned to second in command of Egypt. Total reversal of fortune. David started out as a shepherd. He, uh, he, was, um, he was oppressed by King Saul, who was threatened by him. But later he took Saul's place and became greater than Saul. And then, of course, there's always Mordecai, who is like the, the grand poobah of these kind of situations, where he went from having his head on the chopping block to being number two in the kingdom um, and inheriting all of his enemies' uh, wealth. So, you know, the point is that these people didn't get rich by taking advantage of their neighbors which is the very definition, again, of what it meant to be greedy for gain. Now, there were actually very legitimate ways to gain wealth in the ancient world, and they were mostly all agricultural. You know, even with the Roman senators, 
Now you think about the rich of the rich. These Roman senators, they controlled the, apparently they controlled like 90 something percent of the land and there weren't many of them. Um, now they got most of their wealth from their vast estates, okay? And that's the only kind of wealth they were willing to admit to, uh, to getting. Now they took bribes, yeah, of course they took bribes. That's, you know, that's the way it works in ancient Rome. But what they weren't willing to admit to is the money they made through trade. Where you buy from this person and sell it elsewhere at a premium, they did that through middlemen secretly. Because it was considered really crass and shameful behavior. So, you know, although they weren't entirely cool with capitalism, they were willing to oppress poor landowners and take land for themselves. <laughs> they weren't willing to buy and sell, you know, and make a profit, but they were willing to take the land of poor people. You know. I'm sure that made perfect sense to them. <laughs> um, so, I like to compare this kind of society, you know, this limited good, zero-sum society, to you got a company, and in the company we got a room with ten guys in it and one pizza. It's a, it's a extra cheese pizza with stuffed crust. Just, I want to know, I want everyone to know how serious this is. Okay. The pizza, and it has turkey pepperoni on it too. The pizza's divided into 12 slices. The boss gets two slices, and maybe the personnel director gets two, but everyone else gets one slice pizza. This pizza has been divvied up, as you can see, according to rank, which is another word for honor as it was defined in the ancient world. Okay. And nobody would have objected to it being divided up like this. It's like, well, of course, the guy with the most position, the most status, gets the most pizza. Duh. I mean, you know, this wouldn't have bothered them. They would have just saw it as a fact of life. You know, um, but okay, so what if Joe in the mailroom, what if he takes two slices for himself? That means that somebody else doesn't even get one piece. Or maybe they get a half a piece. Maybe two people get half piece. Now, we don't have a limited good society ourselves, so we just order another pizza. But in the ancient world, it's like, there's only one pizza. You can't get another. And so when Joe took two pieces, he was oppressing Ted, who now has to go hungry. Everyone in the room would see Joe as being greedy for gain. He was prospering at the expense of his neighbor. Although people would have no problem with the higher-ups taking two pieces because they would believe that they deserve them by right of birth and excellence, they'd be really hostile and resentful towards Joe. After all, he was on their level. Where does he get off having more than them? So he would no longer be trusted within the community because he quite literally stole something that he didn't inherently have the right to take based on his position in the company. Now, best example in the Bible of this is the Sadducees. Historically, we know that the family of Ananias, or Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, was buying the high priesthood from the Romans on a yearly basis. Because of this, they also owned the business rights around the Temple Mount. And they profited from the money changing that took place when people paid their temple tax or brought sacrificial animals, wine, and fine flour with foreign coins. The money was then used to take advantage of poor landowners who needed loans, and when they defaulted on said loans, their property was confiscated. This was life in Roman-occupied Judea. And it wasn't any different in Galilee, Transjordan, and Perea, except that it was the Herods doing it instead of the, the Sadducees and the, um, the procurator. Now, people weren't getting rich honorably through agriculture and working their own land, but dishonorably by taking advantage of the economic oppression of the times. Now, in the Old Testament, which the Jews call the Tanakh, and which I like to call the Hebrew Scriptures, we have the prophets crying out about one thing more than anything else. And it wasn't idolatry. It was the economic oppression of the vulnerable by those who were greedy to gain at their expense. 
mentioned far more often than charges of idolatry. God set up this system in the law where if they were obedient, every family would live on their own land forever and have more than enough to eat and prosper and even gain wealth. But some weren't content with enough and they were violating God's laws in order to, pr to oppress both the land by not giving it its um, rest year every seven years and they were oppressing their neighbors. Now Sodom is also a good example. So they, and they were doing that because they were greedy for gain so they were robbing the land. So they weren't just robbing their neighbors, they were robbing the land itself. They weren't giving the land its rest. And, and they went into exile because of it. Now Sodom's also a good example of this sort of greed. I'm not sure if you've ever noticed Ezekiel 16.49, but it states that the sin of Sodom wasn't homosexuality, which is commonly taught, but instead oppression. The inhabitants were wealthy, arrogant, and overfed, and they oppressed the needy. Where rampant greed exists, you also find other dehumanizing crimes, like rape gangs. And when there are rape gangs roaming around a city, I'm not really more offended if the rapists are gay than straight. Just, just saying. I don't know where we got the idea that that's particularly more horrible. Um, so, to sum up, getting rich was not what made one greedy for gain. It was how one went about accumulating wealth. Remember, um, Abraham was given wealth as a gift from God. So was Jacob. So was David. So was Solomon. Of course, Solomon did some messed up things. We're, we're just not going there. Um, and Mordecai. These people were given wealth as a gift. It, they didn't have it because they were greedy for, well, Solomon, you know, never mind. We're just, Solomon is like a whole other program. Um, so, Bill Gates wouldn't qualify in the ancient world as greedy for gain because he's making a product that we don't really need and doing us the favor of selling it to us. That's how it would have been looked at in Bible times. It would be no different than being a blacksmith or a potter or a basket maker or a tanner or, or what else and charging someone for your wares. You either want to buy it or you don't. Okay. <laughs> so we're coming up on the break here. I just want to make sure that everyone understands and, and I can I hope I can see you all nodding. No, that's that's really kind of alarming. I, <laughs> I'm hoping you guys are understanding. It, you know, so the way we look at greed, we tend to look at anyone who's, we tend to look at people who are greedy just because they're getting rich. Well, that is not the way it would have looked like in the ancient world. That's not the way it looked like in the Bible. Because there are legitimate ways of accumulating wealth. And wealth is one of those things, along with children, along with good harvests and along with a whole other things that are listed as the blessings in the Bible. Of course, I always find it interesting that generally if you, you can have children or wealth, but you can't have both. <laughs> but that's because we you know we're not living um, in a constitutional theocracy. The uh, world as it was, you know, when it, it, the world as it will be with uh, simply uh, God is king under under King Messiah and everything is as it should be and we don't we don't have all the challenges of living here in exile where we have to buy land and and we don't inherit it. Um, but yeah, I hope that makes sense to you. In the second half here, we're going to talk about some of the safeguards in Scripture that were set up to help keep people from being greedy for gain from oppressing each other, and we're going to talk about logistically and realistically what does being greedy for gain look like in society in big and small ways? Not only in the lives of people who we would point and say they're greedy, but in our lives. The things that we do to people wrongly that deprive them of what God has given them or what they have earned, perhaps what we want. It all counts as greed. And, you know, it's, it's easy to see it in the really drastic and dramatic stuff. It's always harder to see it in our lives 
and in the lives of those we love and respect. But you know, that's what the Bible, the Bible is our mirror. Okay, I will be back in about five minutes. I will see you then. Hi, this is Tyler Don Rosenquist back for the second half of Character in Context. And we've been talking about what greedy for gain means in scripture in the original context. Now, we already explained all that, and so now I want to talk about the safeguards that scripture sets up to protect, one, people from acting on greed, and obviously they also protect people from being oppressed and preyed upon. Remember, you can't be called greedy for gain unless you are willing to oppress people in order to take from what they have, the things that they need, in order to get them for yourself. Greedy for gain is not acquiring wealth because we see from the stories of Abraham and Jacob that, you know, acquiring wealth was something that was done. It was something that was even considered a blessing in the proper context. So what are the scriptural safeguards, uh, the commandments, the laws in the Torah? Well, first of all, there were things that people could do if they were in debt that would keep them from falling too deeply into trouble. And it would keep them from being oppressed because people who were in debt in the ancient world were incredibly vulnerable. It's not like you could go to the bank and get a loan. You couldn't declare bankruptcy. Um, you couldn't really move away and start again. Uh, there was just, there were no options except for most societies had ways to, to deal with it. Now, with most societies in the ancient world, one of those things was selling yourself into slavery for life. <laughs> um, now the Bible says, no, you cannot do that with, um, with your brothers and sisters. You, you can't buy them for life. What they could do if they were in dire need is you sell yourself into slavery for six years. Now, if you did this, you and your family, you would be temporary slaves, but you had to be freed after six years and you couldn't be treated badly. Um, you know, your daughter wasn't going to end up as this guy's concubine or anything that was expressly forbidden. She still had to be married legally. Um, but like I said, it was temporary and you were treated well. And when you were released at the end of six years, um, the person who quote unquote bought you was really more of a lease situation and who had been caring for you all these years, they had, they couldn't send you away empty handed. They had to send you away with gifts, probably things like seed. So you could, um, you could plant, um, crops on your ancestral plot, that sort of thing. You know, that was a protection that was in place for, um, not only the person who sold themselves, but the person who, who, uh, quote unquote bought them. He had to give them back after six years. Now we see Jeremiah was um, one of, we remember we uh, talked about the verse from Jeremiah six at the beginning of the show. And it talked about everyone from priest to prophet and everyone is, um, is greedy for unjust gain. One of the things that was going on during that time and they got in trouble and Jeremiah had to rebuke them for it. And it was actually the last straw with God. These people were buying Hebrew bond servants or not bond service, Hebrew, Hebrew slaves. And then they weren't releasing them after six years. And then they promised they would. And they did the covenant of pieces walking through the Africa and they didn't do it. So that was really some serious mojo in, and God says, you know what? You guys started out as slaves. You're going to enslave my people permanently. You know, you guys are going into exile. That's it. You have become the Egyptians. We're just, we're not going there. Uh, the other option for somebody who was in severe debt was to, oh, and also on the Shemitah year, every um, seventh year, everyone's debts were erased. So if people owed money, the, the debt was erased. That protected everyone. You couldn't hold people in perpetual debt. And um, you couldn't fall into perpetual debt either unless you kept doing the same thing over and over again. The, um, the other 
option was to lease your land for a period of up to 49 years, but that land would revert back to your family um, at the end of the, the Jubilee. So at most it was going to be, and the Jubilee was a set time. So at the most you were leasing your land to somebody and they would farm it and improve it and do everything on it and they would get all the crops off of it for up to 49 years. Then you got it back. So the Bible does have safeguards in place to protect us from our worst nature. But last night I was praying about being greedy for gain and, and what kind of sins lead into it, what the root issues are. And we've got to look at coveting being the primary sin behind being greedy for gain. You want something that somebody or other people have. That requires basically ingratitude. If somebody else has something, we've got to say, well, either they got it through ill-gotten gains, and then that's between them and God, and God's going to have to deal with it, or God gave them that. All right, whether it's money or authority, um, respect, just um, good reputation, anything that somebody has that they've either earned or God's given to them or they've gotten through whatever reason, if we're looking at that and saying that should be mine, well, that's ingratitude. That's that's a really dangerous, that's a dangerous place to be. Um, because it's saying that God didn't give me what I am owed. Okay. In the end, coveting always comes down to God didn't give me what I deserve. That requires a lack of trust in God. Saying, well, I know what I need better than God knows. And we can't do that. It's just this, it's, it's this snowballing effect. And finally, you know, it just leads to a refusal to love others. And... You go after them and you you go after that thing and you are willing to oppress people to get what you think you have coming to you and oftentimes by taking down the people who do have it. Now, obviously, we're going to get like, we're going to go like the example that I would hope that none of you or I would ever participate in. That's con artists. Con artists don't want to have to work for their money. They want to steal it from others by tricking them. They see other people have money, even if they don't have much money, they want it. They're going to go and get it. Con artists are like the definition of greedy for gain. Truly. Thieves. Any kind of thief, because obviously con artists are thieves. How about price gouging during a disaster? When it's not absolutely necessary that somebody's had to pay a higher price to get Supplies in, that's one thing, but price gouging because they can and they want to profit now off of other people's mis misery. That is being greedy for gain. That's oppressing people at a time they can ill afford to be um, taken advantage of. Now, I got a book in the mail yesterday. It's called The Lost World of, to World of Torah, and it's written by one of my favorite teachers, John Walton. And last week, before the book was even released, you know, authors often send out copies to different people so they will read it and review it. And I saw this headline that just made me furious. It says, um, Wheaton Scholar or something like this says to throw out the Old Testament. And that's not exactly what it said, but it did say throw out the Old Testament. Now, John Walton is an Old Testament scholar. He is kind of the Old Testament scholar. He knows more, he, he is who all my friends and I who teach together, we cut our ancient Near Eastern context teeth on Walton's writings. He is incredibly well respected and rightly so. But all it took was this one review of his book, not written by other scholars, because other scholars have glowing reports to say it, but written by a journalist who used to work for Time Magazine. So this is someone who writes about religion, but he's not a scholar, he's a journalist. And he is saying, and I, I'm, I've am i already started reading the book, and <laughs> I'm not sure exactly where they get this idea, that John Walton is saying to just throw out the Old Testament and the Old Testament laws. Well, that's not what John Walton is saying. 
but all this all this website had to do was say that and and write their opinion of what he is really saying and really talking about by including examples of things that according to his release he never even addressed and i haven't seen him address but these guys are writing it in what they're doing and, and then the comments at the bottom who also haven't read the book but they're saying you know john walton's in danger of damnation and, and this sort of thing not because they read the book not based on evidence but based on reading something that claims to be faithfully representing well what's happened here is people who are not scholars are stealing the reputation of a scholar and a well-earned reputation and it's sad because Believers shouldn't do this sort of thing to one another. Believers shouldn't do this to anyone. Really, we shouldn't be degrading and demeaning and undermining our brothers and sisters in Messiah unless there is a darn good reason. It, it, it's, it's one thing if you find out that a guy is a serial adulterer. You know, that needs to be brought before the corporate body if he's unrepentant right but just over disagreements you're going to say that someone is saying throw out the only portion of the bible that he is you know that he he teaches on he's a professor at wheaton college that's his life is is explaining and helping um layman and other scholars understand the world that the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures was written, and he's great, done a great service to the body of Messiah, and yet one bad article misrepresenting him is being believed. Well, right there, greedy for gain. I'll tell you, if you may not see it, but it's a very difficult thing to write a book, and you really put yourself out there. I've written six books and it's very easy for people to come along who have never studied the material and have never written a book for themselves and do not know what it is like to go through the process and review the scholarly materials and just come in and misrepresent what I wrote, which doesn't normally actually happen because nobody cares. <laughs> but with John Walton, he has it. He's internationally known. So these people who aren't scholars can look like they are better than he is by alerting everyone to the dangers of reading this book, which, as far as I can tell, so far is not at all dangerous. It's a paradigm shift, but not dangerous. Um, let's talk about something related. We see this on social media all the time. Believers belittling one another in general. Now, I see it with people who are in fringy kind of ministries, especially, where, you know, it's one thing to teach. I don't, when I am teaching a concept or teaching against a concept, I teach against the concept. I don't mention the 14 teachers who subscribe to that. They're my brothers and sisters in Messiah. I don't need to mention their names. I don't need to demonize them. I don't need to try and um, exalt myself over them because, you know, they may have things right that I have wrong. I wouldn't want them doing that to me. Loving others as you um, would want to be loved, you can't be the slightest bit hypocritical in that. There is no reason for me to go after another teacher unless I have a reason for people not want to be listening to the teacher. Unless, like I was saying before, they're a serial philanderer and they're excluded from leadership in the body of Messiah because of unrepentant sin. The only reason I can think of for me to, to publicly call out names and to undermine a brother or sister in Messiah is so that I can rob them of their influence, the respect that they have, their audience. And I actually see that quite a bit. Um, you know, you'll see, a, you'll see a video and somebody will say, oh, such and such teaches this. What a moron. What an idiot. What a dangerous person. They're only teaching this to get in good with their friends and family. And everyone listening just says, 
Yeah, you know what? That's right. When they don't even know that's right. Always be very, very careful of anyone who is telling you about other people's real hidden secret motives because they don't know. Only the only person who ever was able to do something like that was Yeshua, Jesus. You know, he knew the heart of people. When we do it, we generally have agenda behind it. We're not only undermining and, um, and belittling and demonizing another believer, but we are doing damage to the gospel of Messiah. No one is going to believe um, unbelie as far as unbelievers go. And, and, and our witness to unbelievers is the most important witness of our lives. No one is going to believe that we are any different of the world than the world if what we're teaching looks more like the Jerry Springer show than, than a sermon from our Lord. And you know, he had some severe enemies. And he had the Sadducees who were coming after him. He had the Herods. And yet, you know, we rarely see these people being, the Sadducees almost never get addressed at all. And they were vile. Nobody in history, you can't find a history book written by anyone that has anything positive to say about the Sadducees. They are universally hated. Um, Josephus said the, uh, the, the Sadducees have no friends except for the rich. <laughs> Greedy for gain. There we go. We were talking about earlier. But we can't be ambitious in the body of Messiah. We all need to be satisfied with the amount of authority that we have been given. Any respect that we have, we need to earn it ourselves and not by disrespecting other people. It's a way of stealing. Just because I might be jealous of somebody else's ministry doesn't mean I go after them. Doesn't mean I, I ridicule them, undermine them, make you not trust them, make you think that they have some secret hidden agendas, that they're actually evil, pointing out their every little flaw. Because I'll tell you something, if I'm not willing to talk about the 99% they're getting right, how dare I talk about the 1% they're getting wrong? It's a covetousness. It's dangerous, it's evil, it's really cruel. But okay, that's people in the ministry or people who want to be in the ministry. Because when you come out and you're on social media and you're denouncing and you're teaching what's actually right, you are taking on, you make no mistake, you are taking on the role of a teacher. All right? You got to be very careful because teachers are going to be held to a higher standard. And unless you're willing to be judged by that standard, just back right off. <laughs> But what do just normal people do, normal believers? Well, the really sad thing is that normal believers are bad about posting fake news. And I'm going to give a really, really vile and out there example. Um, what was it a year ago or so? And I saw the story again this year. The most notorious fake news site on the internet yournewswire.com, don't go there. They don't need the advertising dollars. Um, they wrote a story, and they're always writing these insane stories that have nothing backing them up. They just make claims. And people read them, and they say, oh my gosh, that's terrible. I need to repost this and tell everybody. Well, they posted a story that Meryl Streep, the actress, who you never see in the tabloids because she keeps her nose down. She just, you know, she's not one of these crazy people. Um that she was eating babies for New Year's. Seriously? And the only people I saw passing on that story were believers. How can we represent God while posting without evidence, just based on allegations and hearsay and gossip from unreliable witnesses that we haven't even bothered to investigate and we don't even know who they are because they're nameless, faceless, whatever. How can we see something and then pass it on accusing somebody of what is, I mean, let's, it's, it's a crime against humanity. It's a crime against the universe. That's a real person. I don't care if you are jealous of her fame, of her money, of her influence, of the way she looks, of anything. 
I don't care if you like people from Hollywood. I don't care. I don't even know if she's liberal or conservative. I don't care. When I watch her, it's because she's a good actress. I'm not, you know, going to her as for for religious or um, political advice. But I'll tell you something. No one, I don't care who they are, deserves to have that kind of of allegation one made about them outside of a court of law okay and passed around by people who claim to be representing the God of truth and integrity patience mercy gentleness humility I'll tell you something if we were truly truly as spiritual and humble and meek and kind and gentle and self-controlled as our Messiah told us we need to be in order to follow him and be his disciples there is just no way on earth that one we would even read such a thing much less pass it on you know I I challenged somebody one time I said you're a believer why are you reposting something so horrible and evil about somebody and they said well you know it sounded off but I posted it just in case it was true just to kind of spur conversation and it's like okay well let's look at it this way what is the second greatest commandment to love our neighbors would you have posted that story about some uh, about somebody you love about anyone you know would you have posted it for the sake of conversation and of course, no, they would not. And I say, if you wouldn't post it for the sake of conversation, if it was somebody you love, then what you're really saying is that you do not love anyone who you do not know personally, who you do not agree with personally. You hate this person because nobody would post anything about somebody eating babies unless they had either just a casual disregard or an intense hatred and if you don't actively hate somebody but you are willing to post that kind of stuff the amount of disregard that is required for other human beings is staggering that is a dangerous lack of love that is a heart condition that God needs to address in your life that you would even think of posting something so horrific and I asked them I said well if that was posted about your husband what would you do or, or your wife what would you do your mother or somebody you love someone you care about and they'd say well I would be really angry and I would be posting that it's not true and I said well here's the thing you can't prove that it's not true Meryl Streep can no one can prove that they don't eat babies I can't prove if if you accused me of eating babies I can't prove that I don't unless you've eaten every meal with me for the past 49 and a half years and even then you might think that I went out to you know one of my little meetings and, and I, I did it when you know I, I got away from you for a moment and I did it we've gotten into this age of these conspiracy theories that cannot be proven untrue anyone can make an accusation about you and if people really want to believe it you can't prove you can't prove that you're innocent you can't prove that you're a real person you can't prove that you're not actually a CIA person because anyone on the internet can say it and they can get people to believe it and if you try and post your birth certificate pictures of yourself with your parents will say oh well yeah but you're you're a CIA operative of course they can fake that stuff there's nothing you can do and people believe lies about you simply because there's no way to disprove a negative you can't prove that something that isn't true isn't true and so that is something that we all have to look at in our lives do I have the proof that this is true incontrovertible would I be willing to bet my salvation 
that this is true? Would I be willing to um, post this about myself or a loved one? If not, then I'm telling you, you need to stay away from it. Anyway, that is it for this week. I will see you next week. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye now.